Hello, and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. This is week 5, segment 6, and we'll be wrapping up our discussion of the compilation process in the compiler toolchain. In the previous videos, we've seen how the compiler performs the different steps of pre-processing via the CPP command, compilation proper, and assembly of the intermediate code into an object file. The only remaining step left is to then take this object file and link it to produce an executable. This stage is performed via the ld command, which combines a number of different files as shown here into the final output file a.out by convention. As we can see, the linker appears to be doing a bit more than just using our file, however. The only file we control, the output of the previous assembly stage, is the .o file over here. So what's with all the other things shown here? Well, let's take a look. To pick up where we left off, let's review the previous stages. First, we call the preprocessor to create the .i file. Then we perform compilation and code generation via CC producing the assembly code in the .s file. After that, we used AS to produce the .o file. Then we try to execute this object file. But of course we were unsuccessful. So let's go ahead and use the ld command. Hmm, too bad. I guess it couldn't be quite that easy. Seeing some sort of error displayed here, perhaps we should start by looking at the manual page. Okay, as previously noted, ld is invoked as the last step in the compilation process. Here are some options. It sounds like we should be able to run this command shown here. So let's give that a try. Hmm, now we just get a different error. Let's go back to where we started and look at what the initial error actually was. After all, I keep insisting that the error messages in Unix are meaningful and should provide us with a pointer to how to address them. The error shown here indicates an undefined reference to printf. Why would that be? Let's check the manual page. As expected, printf is part of the standard I.O. functions provided by the standard C library, aka libc. And the manual page tells us over here what the right flag is for the linker to link against libc, dash lc. So let's add that to our ld command. Okay, that looks better. No longer do we get an undefined reference to printf, and the command succeeded, only showing a warning. And look at that. Here we have our executable a.out. Let's run it. Damn, the executable fails, but why is that? What type of file did we end up with? Hmm, that looks right, more or less. Perhaps we are missing some other libraries to link against. What libraries do we have on this system, besides libc? Oh, okay, that's a lot. 1100 libraries to be precise. What library might we need here? Let's look again what the manual page had to say earlier. There, it mentions something about a file named CRT0.0. CRT stands for C runtime. And this file provides the various execution startup routines, so we probably want to include them in the linking process. But didn't we try this before? Perhaps we have some CRT files in our directory userlib? Looks like there are several. Which ones would we need? Let's look again at the warning we got before. After all, I also keep insisting that warnings should be paid attention to, even if they don't prevent the command from completing. 
we are looking for the symbol underscore start. Which of the CRT files contains that symbol? There, CRT0.0. Let's link against that. Hmm, okay, different warning. Now we're missing a symbol named underscore finny. This symbol appears to be present in these two files here. But maybe grep isn't the best way to determine which of these files defines the symbol. A better tool might be nm, a command used to explicitly list the symbols from an object file. Here, nm user lib crt0.0 gives us this output, which indicates which symbols are defined and which ones are referenced from this object file. Symbols marked with a T are defined in the text segment of the file, symbols marked with a U are undefined. So underscore underscore start is defined, but Finny is undefined. In the file crti.o, however, we find that the underscore Finny is defined. So it looks like we need both crt0.0 for underscore start and crti.o for underscore fini. Hey, look at that, no more warnings. Let's run our program. Wait, what? A dot out not found? But the file is right there. Why did it say not found? When we run file against this, it tells us that this is an executable that is dynamically linked and that uses an interpreter, libld64so.1, meaning this binary file is interpreted by that. And so the not found message does not refer to a.out here, but rather to the interpreter, libld64so.1, which does indeed not exist. So now what? Let's compare to an executable that we know does work. There, ld is also a dynamically linked executable, but this one uses the interpreter user libexec ldelfso. What's ld.lfso anyway? Oh hey, it has a manual page, how convenient. So ldlfso is a so-called runtime link editor, used to load an executable and all required objects at execution time. So let's tell ld to use this ldlfso thing as the dynamic linker. Okay, now let's run the executable and, oh man, now what? You know what, I don't think this approach is working. Let's try something different. Let's see what cc does when we invoke the linker. Remember, the dash v flag shows us exactly what commands it runs. And here it is. Well, that's a lot of flags, but we see several of the ones we derived. Here's our dynamic linker, the CRT objects, our hello.o file, oh, and over here a few more CRT objects. As we will see in a future video, a bit later in the semester when we talk about shared libraries and the startup of a process, we need to provide a bit of a bookend to our program, provided by the CRT objects begin and end objects to allow the program to start up and return from our main execution. Anyway, let's add these to our command. And... Finally, a working executable. To see but our linker invocation is quite a bit more complicated than just running ld hello.o. But wait, 
why is it that we had to specify the CRT files by absolute path, but we could simply say link against libc. Here, the manual page tells us that to link against a given library, we need to pass dash l namespec, and the linker will go and look for a file named libnamespec.a or, in the case of elf, libnamespec.so. To tell the compiler where to look for these files, you can pass the dash capital L flag, which specifies a search directory to be used in addition to the default. We can ask LD to show us its defaults by running it with the dash dash verbose flag, which then shows us that it targets the ELF64x86 architecture, that it uses the start routine for program entry, and that it looks for libraries under user lib. So we should be able to find our seed library right there, and indeed we do. libc.a and libc.so, albeit lesson links. Again, we'll revisit the details of the shared libraries in a future lecture, which is why I'm kind of hand-waving the details here. For our purposes, in the context of the compile process though, let's briefly review. If we want to run through all the stages ourselves, we'll have to run cpp to preprocess our source file, run cc to compile c into assembly, run as to turn assembly into object code, and run ld to link the object file with the c runtime code and the standard c library to create the executable. But of course we can make our life a bit easier and have the compiler driver perform all these steps for us in a single command. Here we create the .s file. We observe the default include path used by the preprocessor over here. And finally end with the invocation of the linker. And if all works out, then we get a working executable. Hooray! Now, as you can tell, what we described as a simple sequence of steps ended up being separate commands, each with some perhaps surprising complexities and many, many command line options. But we saw that we can let CC drive the whole process, as we are used to. CC takes all of the different command line options and may then pass them through to the other commands as needed. In so doing, it is important for us to understand that the order of the flags may matter. This is perhaps a bit surprising in that most Unix tools do not care about the order in which command and flags are given, but for this tool it does make a difference. We will illustrate this by example in a future video. For now, simply make note of this and perhaps review the manual pages to see where the order might play a role. We also saw that the compiler may have a set of defaults built in, but also that the behavior of the tool can be influenced, as so often is the case with our tools via the environment. Again, a lot of these details will seem esoteric to you now, but with time, you will come back to the behavior of the compiler as it goes through the different stages and repeated references to the manual pages will be inevitable. Now, while this concludes our high-level coverage of the compiler, you may also have noticed that throughout this series of videos, we occasionally made use of another tool to help us save ourselves some keystrokes and to build certain files using previously specified rules, the make utility. Make is an incredibly useful build tool as part of the Unix development environment equally important to understand, which is why we will cover it in our next video. So stay tuned, and thanks for watching. Cheers!